So here, here's some choices, okay? You want really complex, you go to answer to Joe. Yeah, that one's, that one's, I haven't read that one. I would love to, I would love to do that. I vote for that. That one's like, what, 90 pages or something? It's not that long. Yeah, it's, let's see. Answer to Job. Yeah, it's not long, but it's really complex. I mean, we can take about a page a week. 108 pages. Sounds good. <laughs> well, the only paragraph that matters... Three paragraphs from now, 752 to 754. Right. Let's knock that one off in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. Let, let me let me cut to the chase for you. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this to you. Now, I had an epiphany when I read this because you know I could never get what religion was about and. You know, I obviously I've bro been brought up as a as a young man in the late 20th century, so the scientific method and everything is very in the ascendance and so on. And I'm saying, you know, what the heck is religion about? And I think a lot of people think that. I mean, and Jung was saying, religion lost its numinosity. I guess it's 751 too. Right, 751. What most people overlook or seem unable to understand is the fact that I regard the psyche as real. They believe only in physical facts and must consequently come to the conclusion that either the uranium itself or the laboratory equipment created the atom bomb. That is no less absurd than the assumption that a non-real psyche is responsible for it. God is an obvious psychic and non-physical fact, i.e. a fact that can be established psychically, but not physically. Equally, these people have still not got it into their heads that the psychology of religion falls into two categories, which must be sharply distinguished from one another. Firstly, the psychology of the religious person, and secondly, the psychology of religion proper, i.e. the religious contents. It is chiefly my experiences in the latter field which have given me the courage to enter into the discussion of the religious question and especially into the pros and cons of the dogma of the assumption, which, by the way, I consider to be the most important religious event since the Reformation. Now, the doctrine of the assumption, which Pope Pius XII promulgated, was that the Virgin Mary entered into heaven with God. Okay which he didn't do until 1950. So until 1950, the Virgin Mary was just another woman who had a baby. But in 1950, the Pope finally acknowledged that all the Catholics were running around saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> and praying to the Virgin, right? And so in 1950, the Pope let the Virgin Mary become part of, sort of part of the trip, sort of on the, she sits up there with the Trinity, right? She's the, the fourth part of the Trinity, okay? Which, by the way, I consider to be the most important religious event since the Reformation. It is a petroscandaly for the unpsychological mind how can such an unfounded assertion as the bodily reception of the Virgin into heaven be put forward as worthy of belief? But the method which the Pope uses in order to demonstrate the truth of the dogma makes sense to the psychological mind because it bases itself firstly on the necessary prefigurations and secondly on a tradition of religious assertions reaching back for more than a thousand years. Clearly, the material evidence for the existence of this psychic phenomenon is more than sufficient. It does not matter at all that a physically impossible fact is asserted because all religious assertions are physical impossibilities. That's what got me. All religious assertions are physical impossibilities. If they were not so, they would, as I said earlier, necessarily be treated in the textbooks of natural science. But religious statements, without exception, 
have to do with the reality of the psyche and not with the reality of the physis. What outrages the Protestant standpoint in particular is the boundless approximation of the depra to the Godhead and in consequence the endangered supremacy of Christ from which Protestantism will not budge. In sticking to this point, it has obviously failed to consider that its hymnology is full of references to heavenly bridegroom, who is now suddenly supposed to have a bride without equal rights, who is not to have a bride without equal rights, or has perchance the bridegroom in true psychologistic manner been understood as a mere metaphor. The logical consistency of the papal declaration cannot be surpassed. It leaves Protestantism with the odium of being nothing more than a men's religion, which allows no metaphysical representation of women. In this respect, it is similar to Mithraicism, and Mithraicism found this prejudice very much to its detriment. Protestantism has obviously not given sufficient attention to the signs of the times, which point to the equality of women. But this equality requires to be metaphysically anchored in the figure of a divine woman, the bride of Christ, just as the person of Christ cannot be replaced by an organization, so the bride cannot be replaced by the church. The feminine, like the masculine, demands an equally personal representation. The dogmatizing of the assumption does not, however, according to the dogmatic view, mean that Mary has attained the status of, God, of a goddess, although as mistress of heaven, as opposed to the prince of the subluminary aerial realm, Satan, and Mediatrix, she is functionally on par with Christ, the king and mediator. At any rate, her position satisfies the need of the archetype. The new dogma expresses a renewed hope for the fulfillment of that yearning for peace which stirs deep down in the soul and for a resolution of the threatening tension between the opposites. Everyone shares this tension, and everyone experiences it in his individual form of unrest. The more so, the less he sees any possibility of getting rid of it by rational means. It is no wonder, therefore, that the hope, indeed the expectation of divine intervention, rises in the collective unconscious, and at the same time in the masses. The papal de declaration has given comforting expression to this yearning, how could Protestantism so completely miss the point? Well, it goes on, but the, those two pages sort of got me, okay, because especially these points, um, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche, not a statement of the faces. And um, I regard the, God, the psyche as real. And God is an obvious psychic fact, not a physical fact, i.e. a fact that can be established psychically, but not physically. I remember being an undergraduate philosophy student, and I read Barclay, and he talked about there's, there's only subjectivity. <laughs> there's, you know, you don't have any, you know, there is no out there. It's, it's all. It's all in here. Well, you, neither in nor out, it's just, it, it's the, uh, well anyway, like you said, it's the psyche, there's nothing beyond that, any, you know, and if you want to, the thing that always amazed me about religion was that there were no women, I mean, the women were always like handmaidens or something, Right. and that, that I didn't, I didn't think was What church right. were you talking about? Hmm? Which church? Are you even it, it, they're all male. Mm -hmm. Well, not that's, in the Catholic Church. Well, Mary, even, Mary has a very yeah, but you got a pope. Well, that's been a woman once, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. well, but even so, it's very male, uh, right? Dominated. It's and it's also. Yeah, the Catholic Church has all male priests. <laughs> yeah, and they're not going to let women. That's what the last guy said. Is the current. 
Well, that's not, that has nothing to do with the Godhead. That's the fact practitioner level. Um, right. I mean, that that's the part of religion which Jung envisioned when he was 11 that God dropped a turd on. <laughs> so I, I was, uh, I remember in the Eastern Orthodox faith, the bridegroom was married to the church. So Jesus was the bridegroom married to the church. Right. Very interesting because that Eastern Orthodox is very rigid in terms of not changing over the over the hundreds of years. You know. Right. But see, that sounds so physical and that was the big thing that got me. It's like my whole life was metaphor. That's why I say psyche. Mm -hmm. Because I couldn't I to no, me, that is a metaphor. That's not a to me, well, married to the church. The church didn't exist till after he was after he died. You know that all, he wasn't a Christian. Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was a Jew. Yeah, right. and you know, Jung wasn't a Jungian. Right, well, and, <laughs> and the and the Bi and the Bible didn't get settled until three twenty five A.D. <laughs> Christianity didn't become Christianity until Paul, really. No, long after that. Well, I mean. He set up the main framework for it. I mean, before that, it was yeah, I guess like I curious of and all of that. Right. Going on. Yeah. But I can never understand why they were so literal about everything. And that to me just blew my mind. That it just seemed stupid to me <laughs> as a kid that they were that they would be so literal about Jesus and the Virgin Birth and and the, the fishes and the wine and everything else. It was just like. You know, what's That's this all about? Why? And, and and of course the atheists and, and dump, dump on Christians all the time by saying, you know, you're you're uh, cannibals because you're you're eating the body and blood of Christ. Isn't isn't that but, cannibalism? But metaphorically, that's fine. Metaphorically, that's it's fine, sense. right? And and historically, yeah. that's what they did. They yeah. humans, you know, would eat actually the flesh of. Of their ancestors. I mean, that's what cannibals did. They, they ate. Did mine. Okay, so anyway, that's. <laughs> I, 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 I've read to you the punchline of Answer to Joe. Yeah, well, I, I that's what that brought out. And so. <laughs> Is that the one that has the line about um, belief versus knowing God? You know that that comes from a video. That the that video. that was a. I saw the video. That was a video <laughs> interview with the BBC. Yeah, that was the a matter of part, right? Right. Yeah, that was good. I yeah. just ordered that. Right. It's a it's a it's a good video. Um, but I mean that was another aha moment for me. Okay, because when he said, "I have no need to believe," I know. Suddenly, I had an epiphany. I've told a Christian that. Pardon? I've told a Christian that. And he, said, he said, don't you believe? And I said, I don't believe. You know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's true. That's right. It's and not a big deal. That's it's not a big deal. Me. They always act like, like it's such a big, case, lofty right? thing, and it's right here. You know, it's, it's like knowing this case. You're in it. Right. Yeah. You're well, in it every day. Something's driving you. You know, I remember... Uh, little prayer that I used to say to myself when I was on my way to school on test days. Okay. Uh, so you're selective. Right. No, no, but... but Fair weather ones. Um, okay, I'll believe today. You know, so, so I'll tell you my little prayer. My little prayer was, uh, Dear God, please give me the strength to do my best on this examination. Okay, and that was actually the right thing. Because if there's a God, the God's here. It's in your heart. It, and, and so at that time, I was thinking of it as up there somewhere. But it's actually here. And, and people don't understand that it's in their heart. Right? And, well, in a way, it's here. Because, you know, it's, you're, you're appealing to something higher in yourself. Yeah, but it's here. It's not up there. I know, but it's yeah, metaphorically. It's, right. I mean, the when, when the football player crosses the goal line and goes, ah, you know, points at the points at the sky, you know, it's not up there. It's in here. 
Yeah, you know, and and that yes. Like God said, "Remember, that's your to do <laughs> get a new touchdown." <laughs> so, answer to Job is one choice. Okay. Now, the the second choice, the second choice, is symbols of transformation, okay. which is also psychology of the unconscious, right? Oh, that was when you talked about last week. Right, which I talked about last week, which was the the book where Jung really stated his differences from Freud. So it's it came out right before the confrontation with the unconscious, and it was him stating his his uh, beliefs in the unconscious at that point, 1912, and then Symbols of Transformation is the redo of Psychology of the Unconscious, which he did 40 years later. Now, the interesting thing about this is there's another book, which is this book, which is called Introduction to Jungian Psychology, Notes on the Seminar of Analytic Psychology, given in 1925. Now, this particular seminar, he gave many seminars to his followers. It's 16 seminars, and in it, he summed up his theory of psychology, basically. Now, this is before he got into alchemy. It's before he addressed Answer to Job. So it's before all of the 30 years he spent on alchemy, and it's before, when, when he wrote Answer to Job, he sent a letter to Tony Wolf saying, I've landed the Leviathan Answer to Job. He landed the big whale, he felt, when he did this. This seminar that he did in 1925 to some of his key followers was 16 seminars done over a three or four month period. And in which he himself summarized his own thoughts on how he was coming. Now, what he says in here, one of the interesting things he says, because I've been rereading it, I read it once and I'm going back through it, is that he's talking about psychology of the unconscious. And psychology of the unconscious came out of a... Uh, there's this one, there was this woman named... Um, Frank Miller. Her, her first name was Frank, a woman named Frank. Okay. And, and Frank Miller, Frank Miller had written, had written basically a diary. Okay. And the diary had been published. She had had it published. And it had been given, among other things, to Flournoy, who was, his, was one of Jung's teachers. And Flournoy gave it to Jung. So he never physically met Frank Miller. And so when he took this um, journal of Frank Miller's, he decided to use that as, a, as an analysis. Okay, and so... Oh did so did she get so, permission? No, because she didn't know anything about it. Okay, so psychology of the unconscious is Jung's analysis of Frank Miller. But what he says in 1925, 12 or 13 years later, is that he didn't realize at that time that he was projecting his own anima on her. Okay, and so he's reading her stuff, but he's projecting anima on her. And meanwhile, what he's talking about her is that she was uh, becoming a, a schizophrenic, right? She was becoming psychotic. And and so she, he uses the... Watch how you work your projections on that. Yeah. Right. Wow. Right. So he's, he's saying later that she was becoming psychotic. When I got this book, Psychology of the Unconscious. I got it on Audible, and I listened through it three times. And for the life of me, I could not figure out what this Frank Miller material was about. It sounded pretty cool to me. There were poems and, and so on, and I thought, yeah, these are beautiful poems. You know, what's wrong with these poems? And so later on, he's, he's talking about how these poems indicate that she was going into the psychosis. And so he talks about that 
in this seminar. And so, you know, we can either go right into to symbols of transformation. I don't think we should go all the way back to psychology of the unconscious because he completely revised psychology, psychology of the unconscious. We could read that and then read this, or we can read this first because this is a summation of his psychology. Okay, so that's two more choices, or three more choices. And then one other choice is memories, dreams, reflections, which is as close as it comes to any autobiography by Carl Jung, except he didn't believe in an autobiography of dates. You know, Carl Jung did this on such and such a date. Barbara Hanna and many others have written those. But he wanted to do a biography of the psychic development of his own psyche. And that's what this book is. So it's talking about, you know, it starts, among other things, with the turd on the cathedral basil <laughs> and, and uh, the vision that he kept secret until he's 65, which we won't discuss during this class. <laughs> And and uh, it takes him right through his life, so you see the developments of his thinking. And I like this book very much, uh, and it is on Audible, and you could read it on Audible and, and uh, chapter at a time, and we could do it in 11 or 12 weeks. Were we reading the last chapter in this, or on our own? Yeah, I would suggest reading it on your own. Okay. Um, I, I, the reason is that the last chapter is an analysis of an individual and I want to as much as possible avoid making this group about psychoanalysis per se. Got it. I'm, I'm more interested in Jung's application to everyday life okay? because it's helped me for 30 years. And I've never been an analysis, and I've never been an analyst. So, but I know that, what you know, whenever I'm in a tough time, if I just pick up any Jung book and start to read it, it calms me down. Okay. Now, Jung in his lifetime, the thing that calmed him down was he'd he'd go start banging at stone. He was a stonemason. Right, so he, he built a house. <laughs> yeah. When when Tony Wolf died, I mean, in in here there's this story about when Tony Wolf died, or no, this is in the Emma Young book. When Tony Wolf died. He was kind of inconsolable, and he went out to Bollingen by himself, and he carved a stone, and in it he about her. In it, he put in Chinese calligraphy words that related to her. I don't remember what they are offhand, but that was his way of coping with the fact that she had died. If anything, is an Emmy Young book, it's saying how in the last, like, 20 years that she was alive or 15 years that she was alive, he used to make jokes about her and so on. And so they weren't so close after the mid-30s because he was off in alchemy and she didn't like alchemy. <laughs> but nonetheless, she was still there every Sunday at the, with the family. So some of the descriptions in the Emma Jung book, which is obviously very thoughtful about Emma Jung, are fairly negative about Tony. But Tony never married, never had children. And she just devoted her life to analysis and, and being an analyst and being the third party. Or fourth. Or fourth or fifth or <laughs> whatever it was, was. So that said something about autobiographical in that book with the lectures. There must be notes or something going on. In oh, this is verbatim. Okay. So this is a verbatim presentation of the of the seminar and, so and there's 16 of them they're, they're not that long um, this one is eight pages the other option I keep 
keep mentioning without yeah. mentioning is the uh, Emma book. The Red Book? No, the Emma book. The, the oh, the Emma book. The the new uh, the, the labyrinth. Labyrinth. Yeah. yeah, labyrinth. We could read that if you like. It's yeah. just a thought. I mean, in terms of of contemporary life, it's obviously an issue. So, um, I, I don't mean I don't mind reading that book if you like. I'm uh, just thinking: like, Are we headed down the theoretical side? Are we headed down the biographical side? You know? I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I, and I, I'm not fussy. I've been through a lot of the Jungian and theory, and I used it a lot as a young artist. And I don't know. I don't know if I need any more theory, but <laughs> you probably don't. I mean, you must be you must be a past master artist at this point, so so you you don't need anybody else's ideas at this point. Well, I use other people's structures, but I might draw them from uh, mythology. Mm -hmm. I, I go straight to the sources now. I, I, Jung was good because he was. Uh, the, the anima animus and the interplay, mm -hmm. you know, so you could structure things that way, and it was good because when I, when I was a film film student, everything I did was relationships. Mm -hmm. you guys are doing all these weird things. I, you know, I think for artists, it's important to understand that you have to get through to the unconscious, regardless of what your art is.